On this video, we're going to work through the star released questions, the new answer choice types for Algebra 1. Uh, we're going to talk about the math, but more specifically, we're going to talk about how to enter those answers into the computer, how, how it's going to look for you, how to use your online resources. So to get to the screen where I'm at, you can go to tinyurl.com slash horn star, okay? And then you'll click through some settings. You know, you click sign in, drop down EOC, go to Algebra 1. Um, there's some settings you can mess with, but then we're going to go to begin test now. And then your first question on these released items will look like this. So what we're trying to do is we're just trying to simplify this expression in number one using our exponent properties. Now, the first thing I want to recognize that up here, we've got our references, our reference materials. So if I click on it, it's going to bring up your formula chart. And for this problem, we're going to use two of these properties. We're going to use quotient of powers, meaning when I'm dividing values with exponents, I subtract those exponents. And then we're going to use our negative exponent property, meaning if I have a negative exponent, I'm going to flip it down to the denominator. So for this one, I'll just kind of work through it real quick, and then I'll show you how to enter your answers. We have x to the 6 over x. We have y over y squared. And then we have z to the 7th over z squared. Now over here with these x's, this x in the denominator is really x to the 1st. So if I'm... Dividing these powers, I can subtract. 6 minus 1 is 5. With the y's right here, it's y to the first over y squared. So if I subtract those, that's y to the negative first, and we'll simplify that in a minute. And then with the z's, I subtract those exponents and get z to the fifth. Now, the only thing left to simplify, I'm going to leave x to the fifth here. I'm going to leave z to the fifth here. But then I'm going to flip it, this negative 1 will go down to the denominator for that negative exponent. So what we have is our answer is going to be x to the 5th, z to the 5th, all over 1. Now remember that, because as soon as I start typing, because of the program I'm using, this writing is going to disappear, but it's x to the 5th, z to the 5th, all over 1. Now, coming down to my keys, there's my fraction, so I'm going to click on it. And then in the numerator, we're going to do x, there's your x, and then there's your power right there, to the 5th, now, before I type z to the fifth, I have to hit arrow to the right, and that will take me out of my exponent. Then z to the fifth, and then I can just kind of click down here in my denominator and do all over y. Um, I'm going to type it in with just y. I doubt we have to put in y to the first. We'll see at the end. It'll tell us if we're right or wrong. But there's the first one, so I'm going to come here to the top and do save and next. Now, for this one, here's our quadratic function. Uh, what is the equation for this function in standard form? Well, my first thing is I'm going to go to my reference materials and see, okay, we're currently, we're, it's not standard form of a linear function. We're doing standard form of a quadratic. So I want the vertex form that we're given to look like standard form as a quadratic. So I'm going to do some math for this real quick, and then we'll type it in. I'll just kind of come over here to the side. If we have um, f of x equals x plus 4 squared minus 18, what I really want to do is I want to multiply this out. x plus 4 squared, I'm going to come over here, and I know this is not going to be neat, I don't have a ton of room, but I'm going to multiply it out with a box. Anything squared means that value times itself. So let me just set up a little box over here. We're going to do x plus 4 times x plus 4, and let's multiply it out. x times x is x squared, 4 times x is 4x. 4 times x is 4x, 4 times 4 is 16. So whenever I combine these two like terms, you get x squared plus 8x plus 16. So if this right here is the same thing as x squared plus 8x plus 16, and then I bring down my minus 18, the only thing I have to do left is combine those like terms. And what we end up with is a trinomial of x squared plus 8x minus 2, okay? This is our equation in standard form that we're going to type in. So once again, as soon as I click, this is going to disappear. So let's come over here and let's type it in. x squared plus 8x minus 2. So x squared, just like last time, but remember, now I've got an arrow to the right to get out of my exponent. Plus 8x. Oops, I accidentally hit it twice, so let's delete it and then minus 2. Save, next. What value of m satisfies this equation? So we're just going to solve this equation, and then we'll put our answer there. So this is a normal equation that we're going to solve. So I'm going to start by distributing. Pew, pew. 24m minus 18. I bring down the plus 6 equals 
Pew, pew. Um, 16M plus 44. Now I'm going to subtract 16M from each side of my equation, and that's going to give me 8M. I can combine those like terms, minus 12 equals 44, and I just brought that down. Anything I do to one side of the equation, I do to the other. So we have 8m equals 56. So when I divide by 8 on each side, we get m equals 7. Okay? So I'm not going to try to type m equals 7 into my box. I'm just going to type a 7. So I'm going to go over here, click 7. Save. Next. The table shows the total cost of different numbers of square feet of carpet. What is the rate of change? Now, of total cost in dollars with respect to the number of square feet. That just means what is the rate of change of y with respect to x, okay? In other words, rate of change is the same thing as slope. So I'm gonna pull up my references. There's your slope formula. If you forget, it's right there on your formula chart. y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So I'm just gonna pick two points and we're gonna do y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So 980 minus 840. Oh, and by the way, we, you have a calculator. I'll show you in a minute. 980 minus 840. My numerator is 140. My denominator is 20. That should simplify to 7. So it should be $7 per square foot. But, by the way, up here, calculator, you got both your TI graphing calculator and your Desmos calculator. We'll use those in a little bit. But for now, 7. What is the graph of the function, blah? Now, the first thing that we need to recognize is that this is going to be an, an exponential function. And I don't believe exponential functions are on our reference chart. Um, no, they are not, okay? But if it takes the form of a times b to the x, we got to recognize that it's exponential. Now, we're just going to drag these points uh, and the asymptote. But first, if you just knew the math for it, you'd know that this a value is going to be your y-intercept, so I would just drag it to 6. And then every time you're multiplying by 2 thirds, 6 times 2 thirds is 4 times 2 thirds times 2 thirds. Your function's going to decrease over time. Now, the great news about this particular problem is Desmos is going to be beautiful for you. So I'm going to go to my calculator. We're going to go to Desmos, and I'm going to type in y equals 6 times 2 thirds to the x. Oops, i got to make sure my x is in the right place. So there is your function and what it looks like. I can even go bold projector mode, which I like. So you got 6, then your next point is the, uh, the 4. There it is. Okay. Now, if you click here, you can even do the table, and I think the table is helpful for plotting points. So you just put your points in the right place, negative 1, 9, 0, 6, 1, 4. But I've got my points in the right place. Your asymptote is easy. Here's your asymptote, and your asymptote for, for exponential functions in this form, in this form, are always going to be at y equals 0 right here. The graph of this function was transformed to create this graph. What is this new graph? So we're taking our quadratic parent function. I need to recognize that x squared is the quadratic parent function. And we're just going to move it around. Now, because of this notation, it's describing g of x as a transformation to f of x. It's going to be hard. There's ways to do it in Desmos, but I would say for this one, just know what's going on. I need to recognize that a minus 3 in parentheses is going to shift it 3 units to the right. A plus 4 is going to shift it 4 units up. And that minus is going to reflect it vertically and make it a frowny parabola. So I'm going to take my vertex right here. I'm going to shift it 3 units to the right. And there's the other corresponding point. Now I'm going to shift it 4 units up. 1, 2, 3, 4. I shifted this 4 units up. And then I'm going to reflect it. That minus out front right there means I'm reflecting it. So boop. There is your function for that one. Just lets you kind of drag those two dots to where they need to go, and I think they do a pretty good job of clicking into whole numbers. I don't think they're going to have you do decimals on that. Now you got three points shown. 
uh, lie on the graph of a quadratic function, okay? Graph the line of symmetry for the quadratic function. And you're just going to click two points, and then the line will graph them. So if I look right here, you got two points right there. you got one right there and one right there. And one thing we need to know about the axis of symmetry is that it is, in fact, symmetrical. It's going to divide this into two equal parts. This point, it just kind of throws you off, honestly, because I know that if I have these two points left and right of each other, you know your parabola is going to look kind of like this. It's going to go, okay, something like that. But the axis of symmetry is going to divide that perfectly in half, meaning this point, if it's two units to the right, then this point will be two units to the left. They're going to be the same distance from that axis of symmetry. So what I'm going to do to create it is I'm just going to click and then click again. Boom. There is your axis of symmetry. Save. Next. Graph the line represented by 3x minus 5y equals 15. And so what we're going to do to graph this is I'm going to put it into slope-intercept form first. So I'm going to come over here to the side, and you would be doing this on paper or on your scratch paper. But... Um, I'm going to get into slope-intercept form by getting y by itself. So I'm going to subtract 3x from each side. And I'm going to divide by negative 5 on each side. And I get y equals a negative over negative is a positive. And I want to leave my slope as just 3 fifths. And then for my y-intercept, I'm going to do 15 divided by negative 5. And that's going to give me negative 3. So here's your function in slope-intercept form. As soon as I click, this is going to go away because of the writing program I'm using. But we're going to start at minus 3 on the y-axis, and then we're going to rise 3 and run 5. So I'm going to click there first, and then I'm going to go up 3 over 5 and click again. So I'm going to start at minus 3, and then I'm going to rise 3, and then I'm going to run 5. Boom. There's your line. What is the solution set for this system of linear inequalities? And it kind of gives you some steps to graphing it. Um, basically, we're going to graph the lines first, determine if they're dotted or solid, and at the very e end, select our uh, solution set or our desired region. So to graph this inequality, I'm going to start by graphing the boundary line as if it's a linear function. So I'm going to graph uh, a y-intercept of 4 and then do a slope of negative 3 fourths from there. So I got line 1 selected. I'm starting at 4, and then I think it said the slope was, yeah, negative 3, 4, so I'm going to rise 3 and run 4. Boop! Now, because we have a strictly greater than, there's not an or equal to, that means I want our, my line down here to be a dashed line, okay? Now, let's do the same thing for my other one. I'm going to start at minus 5 on the y-axis. I'm going to rise 3 and run 2. So I'm going to start at minus 5 on the y-axis. I'm going to rise 3 and run 2. Oh, sorry, I messed up. So start that, for that first line, we're at 4, and then we do a slope of rise 3, run 4. Okay, so there's that one. Now let's do the other one. We're going to start at minus 5, and then we're going to rise 3 and run 2. So I'm going to start at minus 5. Oh, I'm still doing the same line. Okay, I see what I'm doing wrong. So rise 3, run 4. Then you got to click over here to graph 2. Okay, I think I'm used to delta math. And then what we're going to do is we're going to start at our minus 5 and rise 3 and run 2. So don't make the mistake I made. Click off to do your other graph. Uh, I can go ahead and make it a dashed line since we know it's going to be a dashed line. But start at minus 5 and then rise 3 and run 2. So there are our two boundary lines. Now we're ready to choose our solution set, which is where the shaded regions overlap. We would be above this line because it's greater than, and we'd be below the pink line because it's less than. Well, above this line, the green line would be there. Below the pink line would be there. So we want to be right here. That's where our shaded regions overlap. So I just click there, and it shades it for you. So you'll click graph 1, graph 2, and then at the end, you can do your solution set. Now, it's kind of the same thing, but now we're not graphing a system of inequalities. We're graphing a single inequality. Well, for me, like always, I'm going to start by putting this into slope-intercept form. So 5x plus 6y is less than or equal to 30. So I'm going to subtract 5x. I'm going to subtract 5x. 6y is less than or equal to negative 5x plus 30. And I'm going to divide by 6 on each side of my inequality. And we have y is less than or equal to negative 5 over 6. I'm just going to leave that as a fraction because that's going to be our slope. 
and then 30 divided by 6 is 5. So I'm going to start at 5 on the y-axis, and I'm going to go down 5 and over 6, and it's going to be a solid line. So start at 5 on the y-axis, down 5, over 6, and it's going to be a solid line. Start at 5 on the y-axis, down 5, over 6, it's going to be a solid line, and then uh, I believe it was less than, so we're going to shade below. Yeah. Use the number line to represent all the solutions to this inequality. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to solve the inequality first by hand. So I have uh, negative 3, 2j minus 11. Let me clean that up a little bit. 2j minus 11. 8j minus 9. So let's solve it. So negative 6j plus 33 is greater than or equal to 8j minus 9. So I'm going to go ahead and collect all my j's to one side, all of my constants to the other. So I'm going to move my j's over here. Oops, not 8. So we have 14j minus 9 is less than or equal to 33. And I'm going to add 9 to both sides. And we have 14j is less than or equal to 42. Now, I've kind of run out of room, and so I apologize for this not being neat. Um, but I'll come over here. If we have 42 is greater than or equal to 14j, I'm just going to divide by 14 on each side and get j is less than or equal to 3. Now, I like to flip that around. I think when you leave your inequality in this form with your variable on the right, it's hard to identify. So I'm going to flip it around, and I'm going to write the whole thing as j is less than or equal to 3. Okay, That should be what you would have gotten when you'd solved. So since it's or equal to, we're going to use our solid shaded in circles. This is going to include the 3 itself. And since we're looking for values less than 3, I want to shade the values less than 3 on our number line. So I'm going to click there to select that one, and then I'm going to slide it on over to 3. So those are our values, less than or equal to 3. And we got another problem, just to practice the same skill. So let's, let's do it again, and I'm going to try to give myself more room to solve it. So I'm just going to copy over m minus 7 is greater than negative 2 m plus 0.5. Okay, so we're going to distribute. I've got m minus 7 is greater than negative 2m, and then negative 2 times 0.5 is minus 1. And then let's add 2m to both sides. m plus 2m is 3m, and I'm going to add 7 to both sides and get 3m is greater than 8. Okay, and then um, that came, oh no, 6. Negative 1 plus 7 is 6. I was like, they're not going to give us a fraction. And then I'm going to divide by 3 on both sides and get that m is greater than 2. So now, since it's greater than, I'm going to want to select the open circle. And since it's greater than 2, I want to shade everything to the right of 2 on my number line. That's where the numbers greater than 2 live. So I'm going to click there, and I'm going to bring it over to 2. Hopefully I didn't make a simple error. If I did, we'll see at the very end. The graph represents a quadratic function. Choose the correct answer from each drop-down menu to complete the statement. This graph has a maximum. You see how we have inverted parabola? It has a maximum point, but it has no minimum point, right? Because this graph goes down forever. So it has a maximum, and that maximum value we can see right there is 4. So it's basically like a multiple choice, but it just has some drop downs, nothing too complicated. Save. Next. Lab technicians recorded the population of a species of bacteria each hour for seven hours. The population in thousands after x hours can be modeled by this exponential function. And it tells us it's exponential. Choose the correct answer from the drop downs. The initial population of bacteria was this number. So, so what you need to know about your exponential functions is they take the form of y equals a times b to the x, where this is kind of your initial value, what you start with. In this form, it's the y-intercept. And then this is your growth rate. Okay, that's what it's changing by. So if I look right here, the initial value is going to be 575. They tell us it's in terms of thousands, so our initial population of bacteria was 575,000. The population is growing. 
because our B value is greater than 1. If I simplified 1 plus 0.4, it would be 1.4, okay? Since this number is larger than 1, it means you're multiplying by something larger than 1 over and over again. It's going to be going up, and that rate it's increasing at is at 40% per hour because multiplying by 1 just keeps it constant. When you multiply by 1.4, you're increasing by 0.4, or 40%. So it's increasing at a rate of 40% per hour. The graph of 4x plus 5y equals 20 is shown on the grid. Which points are in the solution set to 4x plus 5y is less than 20? Well, there's a few different ways to solve this. One would be you could take all of these points, like this is the point negative 2, comma 4. You can substitute the negative 2 in for x and the 4 in for y and see which points give you true statements because points that give you true statements are solutions. But I'm going to solve it differently. I'm going to put this into slope-intercept form uh, just because I like to do that with graphs. So I'm going to oops. I'm going to subtract 4x from each side. We have 5y is less than negative 4x plus 20 and then I'm going to divide by 5 on each side and we get y is less than our slope is negative 4 over 5. I leave that as a slope, as an improper, or not as an improper fraction, as a fraction. And then 20 divided by 5 is 4. So um, here's our line. We, we, they've already given us the line on our graph. we got our y-intercept of 4, okay? Our slope's negative 4 fifths. It would be a dotted line if we graphed it, and we would be shaded because of that or equal, or that less than sign would be shaded below. Basically, I did all that math to identify that we have a less than symbol in our slope intercept form, therefore we're going to shade below. That means that's one of your solutions, that's your other solution. So you're just going to click on them on that type of problem. Easy peasy. Next, the graph of the quadratic is, is shown. What are the zeros of the function? Well, you just need to know that for our purposes, right now in Algebra 1 and on this test, zeros are the same thing as roots, which are the same thing as x-intercepts. So all you're going to do, this is going to be the easiest math problem of your life, is we're just going to go click on the two x-intercepts. So there's one of your x-intercepts, boop, and there's the other one, boop. What is the factored form of this? So we got to factor it, and the unfortunate part is this is not a um, multiple choice question, so we can't just take our answer choices and multiply them together. So if I start with 2x squared minus 14x, plus 24, the first thing I notice is that all three of these are even. So I can factor a 2 out to the front before I do anything. Okay? Now, so you can kind of already see by the structure of this, I can put that 2 right there. Now, I'm going to skip the steps to factoring this part in here. Factoring is a long process, and this is already going to be a super long video. So this is going to factor to x minus 3 times x minus 4. This right here, if you factored it, would give you these two binomials. And like I said, I'm skipping those steps for now uh, because I just, I just don't think it's the best use of our time in this video. So 2x minus 3x minus 4. So I'm going to, this is going to disappear, but I'm going to write it in. So we've got a 2. I can drag it. And then we've already got our x there. Minus 3x minus 4. I'm assuming that if I were to put the minus 4 here and the minus 3 here, it would still count it right because um, those should be, these two binomials are interchangeable because commutativity. Graph of a line is shown. What is the equation and the slope of the line? Well, the acronym that I use to explain this is I say hoi vux. And what this means is horizontal lines have zero slope and their equations are y equals a number, while vertical lines have undefined slope, and their equations are x equals a number. Well, as you can see right here, we have a horizontal line. That means it has zero slope, and its equation is going to be y equals a number. So the equation here is going to be y equals 2, because it's a line where every point on it has a y coordinate of 2. The y value does not change, so you can just say it's a constant, y equals 2. The slope is... Zero, because it's a zero slope horizontal line. So those are, that's just a little draggable, okay? Which of the relations shown represent y as a function of x? Well, what you're looking for here is you're looking for it to pass the vertical line test. So if, if I, you know, had my vertical line here, 
this graph is not going to touch my line anywhere in two places at once. So this one passes the vertical line test. Okay, it's a function. This one right here is just a linear function with a negative slope. If you want to pull up that Desmos calculator that we used earlier and type these in to look at it, you would see it's also a function. It's just a linear function that's going to be going down and to the right. So it's still going to pass that vertical line test. Now, if we look right here, we see that I have a couple of points right here where I have one input of 1 leading to two different outputs. I have the input of 4 leading to two different outputs. I have the input of 9 leading to two different outputs. This one right here is not a function. It would not pass that vertical line test, okay? If you wanted to, if you wanted to just see what these points look like, you could put them on graph paper. It has a little graph paper thing here, and, you know, you could add a point, and if you were to kind of have an x and a y axis, maybe you could draw a y axis, you could draw an x axis, and then you could plot some of the points from this table, and you would see that this, this wouldn't pass the vertical line test because you have one input leading you to two different outputs. Indicate whether each statement is an example of association, causation, both, or neither. So, um, when the speed of a car decreases, the arrival time to a destination is later. That's a true statement. If you slow down, it takes longer to get there because slowing down causes you to get there slower. That's causal. But what you know is anytime there's causation, there's also association. Oh, therefore, you'd want to put both. Okay? I'm going to jump down to the third answer choice because I think it's very parallel to this first one. When the oven temperature increases, the cooking time for a casserole decreases. If you make the oven hotter, it cooks faster. That is causation, but anytime there's causation, there's also going to be association. So I'm going to put both. And this, is la this middle one is kind of a classic example. When the temperature increases, the, snail of, the sale of snow cones increases, okay? Um, basically, what you're going to have there is you're going to have association, but it's not really cause and effect, okay? Because what happens is when temperature increases, it's summer. More snow cones are sold in the summer. Oops. Therefore, that's going to be association, but not necessarily causation. And you just click your little check boxes. What is the correct domain and range of this function? It gives you a quadratic function in vertex form. Now, I'm going to pull up my Desmos calculator to graph it. Okay, I can, you can actually identify domain and range from this, but I think it's easier to get a visualization of it. So I'm going to go to my, my Desmos graphing calculator, and let's type it in. So um, I'm going to do y equals. I think you can type f of x. 3x plus 9 squared minus 8. So here's my graph, okay? Now, the first thing that we need to recognize with these quadratics, if it's just a, an equation, there's no application or word problem, its domain is going to be all real numbers. This graph, I could zoom out. It's going to go forever to the left and forever to the right, okay? It might kind of not be hard to tell, but just know that for quadratic functions, domain is all real numbers. Now, look at our range, though. Our range, it's not going to be all real numbers because it doesn't go all the way. It goes all the way up to positive infinity, but it doesn't go all the way down to negative infinity, right? In fact, if you click right there, you see the minimum value is going to be the y-intercept of that, or not the y-intercept, the y-value of that vertex. So while our domain is all real numbers, our range is all y-values greater than negative 8. Negative 8 is the minimum. It's the bottom. So all these other points have a y-value greater than negative 8. So if I click back over here, our domain is all real numbers, but our range is y-values greater than or equal to negative 8. Last question. If these functions are graphed on the same coordinate grid, which statements are true? Select three correct answers. Now, um, this is just your linear parent function, y equals x. This, this is kind of like that, that quadratic problem we did earlier. There's a way to graph this on Desmos, but since it's graphing f of x as a transformation to g of x, um, unless you're really good with knowing how to type this into Desmos, it's, it's not going to work, and I probably just wouldn't mess with it. Instead, I would say we got a three-fourths, so our graph's going to be uh, a little bit flatter, a little less steep, and it's going to be shifted four units to the left. Yes, that plus four means to the left. So we do have that graph of f is a little bit steeper than the graph of g, because this has a slope of one, and this has a slope of three-fourths. Then, if, if one is true, two couldn't also be true, because it just says the opposite. Then we know that to create g, f is translated four units to the left. That's what I said. To create f, you take g, and that plus four means four units to the left. So that's a true statement. And so if this one's true, this one couldn't also be true. 
So then let's look at this. The x-intercept of g is four units to the left of the x-intercept of f. And I think that makes sense, because if you were to take, you know, this graph, and you were to shift it four units to the left, wouldn't it also shift that um, x-intercept four units to the left? I mean, at least for a, a linear function, yeah. Actually, for any function. So we're going to save, and then we're going to hit end test. Yes. And then let's see if I got them all right. Yay, I got them all right because I got all my credit. And that is the end of this long video. Thank you for watching.